Flipping it up and out. Bogan! A reason blocked by Bogan. Good recovery by Andrew Bogan. Let's get rogue. Welcome to Rogue Bows, the basketball series, your favorite basketball podcast. Myself, Mike Procopio, joining you. How it goes it over there in the States, bro? Ah, Bogues, it's going all right. I mean, there's no there's no ticket insurance idea this week, so I'm just taking the week off of refining the NBA. Although I do have another idea for the NBA, but I'll I'll go later in the podcast. <laughs> and I think another thing we can add to the NBA, I mean, it's it's full circus WWF, so I think it's a pretty good deal. We'll talk about it later in the pod, but no, nah, nothing going on, Bogues. Just uh, enjoying a regular Saturday night, my man. That's it. Saturday night as an adult at home, out of trouble. Best way, best way to go uh, for all the all the young listeners. Nothing good ever happens after midnight. So, uh, it's an old adage. I was I was told as a twenty year old. I listened to it towards the end of my twenties, and it, it, it suited me quite well. I never really got in trouble out in the clubs, which is good. All right, teams of the week. Let's get rolling. I'm gonna go with the Milwaukee Bucks. They are playing as we speak. It looks like they're gonna get that win. Uh, at time of recording, they are up against the – who are they playing? Uh, the Miami Heat. They're up nine with four minutes left. So I assume all goes well with that game, but they've they've been great. Um, eight and two in their last ten. Um, I, I caught their game the other night against the Clippers in a grind back game. They were down big, came roaring back. Giannis has 54. They're, they're starting to find it. They're starting to find their rhythm, their rotation. Everything's starting to align. They're only one and a half behind Boston Pro, and, and Boston's had a hell of a season. They've played really well. Boston's let a few easy games slip, most notably Phoenix recently. Uh, but Milwaukee's right on their tail now, so they've got a chance to steal that one seed. Lou, I think they will. I don't know. Milwaukee's probably more in form right now than Boston are, um, but Boston have had a hell of a season, so that's pretty interesting that it was that close. I didn't realize. And... It just seems like they're figuring out rotations. Um, we know our fellow Australian, Joe Ingles, is in that lineup now. He's providing him a nice balance off the bench, shooting the ball well. Um, Connaughton, you know, Porters, they've just got great role players that understand their role that have been to championships. Drew Holiday's made his first all-star team. So a really good mix of um, youth and veterans and athleticism and shooting. And they've got a chance to, to, to get there again, I believe. And they, they've had a really good week, bro. Yeah, I, I think for the one team that's going to challenge Boston in the East, and I think there would be a couple. I think Philly, um, Philly could challenge as well, but I think the one really big time challenge for Boston is going to be Milwaukee. I mean, they're just like fine tuned, you know. And, and you know, Middleton really hasn't found a stride yet, and he probably will, hopefully, will by the end of the year. I think he's only averaging twelve, three, and four um, as we tape the pod. But um, they play together, they move the ball, they guard people. And I think they're going to be uh, a very good opponent for Boston. Hopefully, we get to see a Boston Milwaukee, you know, Eastern Conference final. I think that would be very entertaining. I think the two teams that Boston's going to worry about on their path to a championship are Milwaukee and the Clippers. Even though the Clippers, you know, gave that fucking twenty plus point lead away uh, to Milwaukee, but I think Milwaukee's good. They move the ball. They can shoot. They've got defense. Um, you know, you and I, it's funny, we were joking about Giannis's free throw, and then I think he made like seven out of nine after I, I said that. <laughs> yeah, pro takes me, pro takes me, man, Giannis's free throw is looking shaky. Um, and then he went, he literally went seven for eight, like 30 seconds after pro takes me that, yeah. put the, put the reverse of the pro curse on uh, Giannis. I do think that if, if Milwaukee's going to lose a series, it's going to be on his free throw shooting. I, I really do. Um, look, you know, I, I was talking to a lot of people about this and, Look, the three-point shot to him is almost worthless. You know, like he shoots twenty, like twenty-seven percent from the three. I'm, I'm just saying, whatever he makes from three is just extra, right? You know, he he doesn't like, he doesn't really. He's not one of these guys that like shoot. You know, shoots like twenty-eight threes a game. You know, he shoots three threes a game, right? So it has very little impact in his game. If he makes a few, great. If he doesn't, he doesn't. He goes to the line thirteen times a game. If you're coming back at 65% on your 13 attempts, right, you're probably coming, you know, somewhere in the like eight range. Now, if you could shoot 75 to 80, you're talking about giving up like three or four more points a game. Like that's that's big, especially in these playoff series where these games come out to the last possession. And they're going to hack-a-shack him. His 13 attempts will go to 19. Now, those hack-a-shack deals could get him in good rhythm like he did in the playoffs a couple years back. But... If he can't make free throws, forget about anything else. It's the most valuable shot in basketball if you can shoot 80% from the line. It's, it comes back at 1.6 every two shots you make, 1.6 points per possession. 
And I think it's a huge deal, even more valuable than the three, because he doesn't take 11. If it's Steph Curry and you take 11, 10, 11 threes a game, then the three is more the most valuable shot you got in your in your package. But for him, free throws are going to be big. But I, I, I do agree with you. I think Milwaukee Bucks um, – I was going to take Philly, but you know what? I'm going to jump on the Milwaukee bandwagon. I think Milwaukee uh, was definitely the team of the week. And plus, that game, I mean, 20-plus points down. I mean, I was thinking – I was I was flushing them first half and end up, you know, and these guys end up turning it up and, you know, they, they look really good. Yeah, I agree. Uh, they, they come to the, wrong, the right time of the season. They had a few lulls early on. And, yeah, I even forgot Chris Middleton. You know, he's, he's playing him back to health. So he's not even at full strength right now, and they've still got two two to three months till they need the real Chris Middleton, which is a, a lot of time um, to get him right. So I'm, I'm high on the Milwaukee Bucks. I think the East is as deep as it's been in that top four, um, the, at least that top three that we just mentioned. Brooklyn's probably going to fall out of there with everything going on there, which we'll discuss later. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm liking Milwaukee. All right, uh, week team of the uh, – peace week team for me – I'm going to have to go with the Pelicans. I gave them the benefit of the doubt last week. Um, but this week they had, they've had they had Ingram and CJ back in their lineup for the most part this week. They just beat the Lakers at time of recording. But let's not count that pro. I mean, the Lakers are the Lakers. They, you, you don't count that as a big win. So they still, get, they still get it just because whenever you lose 10 straight, I mean, they were in the top four only a month ago. Uh, yes, they've had injuries, but I would have liked to have seen them you know, during that 10 game losing streak, maybe go three and seven, maybe go four and six sneakily, right? Mm-hmm. That's what the good championship caliber teams do. And that's what they're aspiring to. You know, they want to be a top four co- uh, conference team in, in the Western Conference. They need to be a team that can steal wins when, they, when, when they're not supposed to. You look at the Warriors, you look at some of these teams. Um, Brooklyn today, they just beat someone um, heavily shorthanded. Uh, I'll double check that in a second. But um, you want to be able to beat teams that you're not supposed to beat. They beat, they beat Washington today, Brooklyn did. Completely shorthanded. Um, you got to get some of those wins. So that's why I'm, I'm giving them the nod. Maybe a little bit harsh in some circles, but they need to start winning. They, they're getting healthier. They need to start winning. And, and I think if they keep playing like they were pre the injuries, they've got a chance to get back in that top six. But they've, um, you know, they've, they've essentially fallen off the face of the earth uh, as far as the standings go. They're down to 11, bro. They're not even in the plane at the moment. Now they're tied with Golden State for 10. They're 500. They're 27 and 27. And the thing is, in the West right now, you win two straight games, you get to sixth. <laughs> you know, they're only one game behind nine. Uh, sorry, one game behind six spot, who is the Phoenix Suns. So they'll still be in the mix, I think, at season's end when they get healthy. But uh, 10 straight, you lose 10 straight, you're getting team of the week. Yeah, they're really struggling, Bogues. But, I mean, they they, they got to find a way. You know, something's got to give with the Zion thing as far as, like, staying healthy. I think if Zion, they can't find a way to, you know, get Zion healthy, it's going to be a huge deal for them. I'm not a huge, like, I'm still figuring how Zion sort of fits in to really be a championship level player to really rise your team up. Um, I mean, obviously, besides the points and rebounds that he puts up, but without him healthy, they're, they're in trouble. Now, I will tell you this, the two guys I didn't really watch a lot of, and I'm really impressed by watching, and I'm going to watch a lot more of them, uh, Trey Murphy and Herbert Jones. Those guys really play hard. Um, I, I like the fact that, you know, like they're, they could guard people, they could shoot it a little bit, um, they could straight line drive, they're pretty cool, but, you know, McCollum and Ingram back, I mean, obviously helps them. I think they're, they're still trying to find their legs. Um, I think a couple other guys have been banged up too, like, and they're just trying to, you know, to get back. But look, like you said, even, you know, next man up mentality, you have to have that. And I think that the one thing that they are missing, Bogues, in my opinion, is that guy off the bench that really lights you up, you know, points wise. Like Trey Murphy's a, you know, a shot maker, straight line driver, but he's not an ISO guy. De- Devontae Graham shooter. Alvarado sort of messes the game up with just sort of changing the tempo. Larry Nance is like a finesse guy, rebounder, defensive guy. You know, um, they don't really have that. Even Dyson Daniels, like, you know, he- he's a good player, plays hard, but they do need that guy that's going to, not only when they're at full strength, come in on the second unit and really light things up, but also when Zion goes out or an Ingram goes out or McCollum goes out, they could just step up in the lineup that Jordan Clarkson, even though I'm not an Ubre fan, like an Ubre type of guy that's just going to come in, light you up, you know, and give you like 16 or 17 consistently off the bench in a playoff series, give you 16 to 18. Um, I don't think that that's the one thing they're really missing. And yeah, I mean, you'd think you would expect 
you would expect a little more, even though they did have a lot of their offense out. But I think they're still just trying to find themselves. I mean, Ingram was out for a long time. Um, you know, Zion, I think they, they expect Zion back right around All-Star break or a little after. And, you know, CJ's been playing pretty decent all year. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. But, yeah, I, I, I would uh, – I didn't concur with you this week because of the dick punch. But besides that, um, you know, I give it to the Memphis Grizzlies. But I do agree that that you know, I, I think I gave I, I gave the team of the week last week to to New Orleans, and you know, I see where you're going with this for sure. You got Memphis, you said for yours? Oh yeah, I got Memphis dick punch. I, I don't respect that man. Was that Dylan Brooks, right? Yeah, Dylan Brooks. Not that's that's not cool. I don't care about their history. You know, that's you know, look all these like. All these little deals, these punches, these fights, fucking tired of it. Actually, I'm not really all that tired of it, but like, you know, if you're going to punch a guy, just like go to half court and fucking square up and fight. Fuck this, like, dick punch and stuff. Yeah, I, I give it to the Memphis Grizzlies. Struggling a little bit. I mean, you know, I, I haven't really checked, like, schedule wise and, you know, considering their record and all that in the last 10. Um, I believe they're four, four and six out of the last 10, but. You know, again, like uh, three. I'm sorry, three out of the last ten. Um, Win wise, you know, they gotta they gotta do better. You know, look, you're a championship team. They talk all that shit about being, you know, championship team. This championship team, that. You know, you talk that talk like, you know, you can't go three and fucking seven. You don't have any major injuries. You got most of your team back, and they gotta figure out to, you know, they gotta figure out how to get things done. I mean, look, you got, you know, you got all that firepower, all that talk. You, 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 know, you haven't really done, you haven't really turned the corner yet, but you, you, you talk to like you, the 86 Celtics and that dick punch sort of, you know, not a big fan of that. I'm not a big fan of cheap shots like that. Well, their record's not great either pro in, in, I guess against winning teams. I don't know what the number is, but I saw something that they're below 500 against winning teams. And then if you remember, was it John Moran that was asked about if anyone scares him in the West? And he said, no, um, well, they're 15 and 16 in the West. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, they're the only team. Um, basically, I'm looking right now at the standings. Every team in the 10, uh, even even New Orleans at 11, have winning records in the West besides Memphis. Right. So every team in the 11, I'll say that again, has a winning record in the West right. with two Western Conference opponents besides the Memphis Grizzlies. And they, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting over all their, all their everything that they're about. Um, I really am. I mean, I know the grit and grind and all that kind of stuff, but I, I totally agree with Clay Thompson's comments a month ago. You can't call yourself a dynasty um, until you start winning championships. You've done nothing, and I think they're, I think they're a front running team until they prove. I hope they prove me wrong. I hope I get to you know they get to the playoff series and they and they grind to a conference finals or a finals, and I'll take my medicine and say they prove me wrong. But I can't see. It. I, I just feel like they're a really really front running team when things don't go their way. It capitulates for them. Um, I still think there's a bit of push and pull on that team with who's the second option, who's the third option, who's the second star, who's the third star. You know, I think that's going to start rearing its ugly head now with a young team. So, not a huge fan uh, at the moment. I think they're they're playing playing okay basketball. I mean, they're second in the West. There's a lot to be positive about, but I just think that they're getting way too ahead of themselves and where they are in their trajectory. And I think a little bit of humble pie for them could go a long way in helping them get get even better than they are. So I think it's a good pick this week. And I was hoping you pick Memphis so I could uh, get on my high horse and, and call them front runners again. Yeah, I mean, a lot of teams in history has done what they've done, like upset some teams in the playoffs, sort of, you know, show a lot of flair, a lot of um, a lot of tenacity, a lot of talent. I remember in the 90s, uh, the Denver Nuggets knocked off, uh, I think it was an, a 1-8 series with Seattle, with uh, Gary Payton and, and Sean Kemp. They knocked them those guys off in the first round, and, and you thought that they were the next team. And look, there's a lot of things that go into this that you know sort of set you sideways. You think you're sort of on the path. You've got all these young players. Everything's good, like you said. Team, you know, players start like complaining about who's this option and who's that option, and it really hurts you. You know, the one thing you got to understand is John Morant's your number one option. Everybody else just has to figure it out. There's enough possessions and there's enough offensive bias in this league where everybody's going to get their numbers. It doesn't matter what option you are. You know, if you're an efficient player, I was talking to a client today about like usage rate versus consistency and efficiency. If you're a good player, I mean, you're going to have, 
you know, usage rates of like 15, 18, 19, still high enough to score 17, 19. It doesn't matter how many plays they run for you. You got to do your job. And if you want to win a championship, you got to put that ego shit aside. Easier said than done. But like if there's going to be some inner turmoil there and the biggest problem for them, I think, Bogues from last year to this year, Jaron Jackson's back. So a lot of those uh, that's 27 extra minutes that can't be dispersed to other people. It's extra shots. It's extra possessions. It's extra touches like that. Maybe Desmond Bain doesn't get. Maybe Dylan Brooks doesn't get. You know, and, and that's something that they're going to have to figure out, or they're really never going to get over this. And look, it, it, we're in an era of shit talking without backing it up, right? Like, you know, what NBA player isn't delusional about where they are individually in the league versus where their team really is in the league? And look, they're not a piss poor team. They're a good team. They got a chance to make a conference final, maybe even more. But they got to win games and they got to start, you know, they got to start figuring some stuff out. They got to start moving the ball better. They got to start just sort of playing together more. And it's easy to talk that shit and tweet that shit out and, you know, put that shit on Instagram. But like to really internally get shit done, they got to figure it out and stop talking. Well, I don't give a fuck if you talk or not to me. Why You got to produce. I don't give a fuck about how much talking you do. If you produce, I don't give a fuck. It's, you know, it is what it is. But you got to produce, and they're not – right now they're eh, – they're not really – they're producing, but they're not producing, if, if you know what I mean. Totally. Yeah, I mean, they're, 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 like, people, might, people might look at us like we're crazy. They're sticking in the west. What's the problem? But, you know, for all the talking they're doing, they've they, they got a lot of work to do, and they've got a lot of good teams they got to get through. You know, they could potentially face Golden State in the first round, <laughs> the way things are going. No offense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's – You know offense, but – Crazy. Do you think Golden State is really fucking afraid of Memphis? Do you think – that's my yeah, point. They're not. The I don't think anyone is. No. In a one game, I honestly don't think. I don't think anyone no. in the in that in that in, in in the West right now who is someone really afraid of them. Like, are you going to try to dodge Clippers, them? No, you Golden State. No, I mean, yeah, look, I mean, I'd even argue a healthy Pelicans would give them a good run, right? Like, I think if the Pelicans were healthy tomorrow with Zion, Ingram, and, and CJ fully back in the rotation and playing. Like, I think they could knock off the Memphis Grizzlies in a seven-game series. Um, I just don't – I'm not sold on them. And like I said, I might be proven wrong. I think they might get – they'll get a first-round series again and, and they'll bomb out in the second. And that'll be like, okay, yeah, we had a good year. Like, no, you, you, you're a dynasty, right? Like, you need to be you need to be knocking on the door in the finals if you're a dynasty. So, I think it's fair. I think the criticism they're starting to they, – they were that grit and grind a season or two ago – before all this talk, they were the love of the league because it was grit and grind, John Morant superstar. And now all the antics, like you said, the nut punch, and there's always something going on. They're always beefing with someone. You're not there yet to be able to beef with all these teams. Like you, you, They remind me a lot of a different style of basketball clippers as far as the their psyche and the, what they're about. Mm-hmm. Front-running regular season team that just bomb out, they fizzle out in the playoffs. So we'll see if they, if they prove me wrong. But um, – yeah, no one's no one's scared of them coming up into the into the finals. All star teams pro. Let's get this over with because everyone loves to have an opinion on it, and I've got some. Um, we're going to go through the all star teams first. So all the selections have been announced. So obviously we go to the Western Conference. Um, that is in the West. You got Paul George, SGA, Jaron Jackson Jr., Lillard, Markinen, Morant, and Sabonis. So there you are. Uh, they're your reserves, your starters. Where are we? Western Conference. Your starters, obviously, LeBron James, Jokic, Williamson, Curry, and Doncic. We go to the Eastern Conference reserves, just got announced. Adebayo, Jalen Brown, DeMar DeRozan, Joel B, Therese Halliburton, Drew Holiday, Julius Randle. And the starters out east are Giannis, Durant, Tatum, Mitchell, Irving. I assume Durant's probably going to miss, so he will get replaced. But I'll give you a list of the snubs, Pro, and then we'll talk about whether you think there should be any changes by your standards? No. How about the this? Snubs ru- let's fucking let's just get her over with. No, no. no f- I don't give a. Fuck. I've got a few. I've got a few that are in, that are that are. I can argue. I don't even uh, know the snubs. I don't even know who the all stars are, and I don't even know who the fucking snubs are. I don't give a fuck. But go ahead, let's <laughs> talk about it. Go ahead. You give me your list. <laughs> all right, the snubs. Siakam's a snub. Uh, Brunson's a snub. Butler's a snub. Davis, Booker, Harden, Edwards, Fox, and Trey Young are the snubs. Now I'll go first. I'll lead you in. One that two that scratch my head in the East are DeRozan and Halliburton. Um, look, Halliburton, I think, has had a great year, leads the league in assists, so I get that. DeRozan, with the way the Bulls are playing, I don't have him in. I mean, I can't, I can't have you in when your team, you know, especially off last season, 
you know, they're, they're in nine right now, but they haven't played great basketball. They're only one and a half away from the 12th spot. Yeah. And then you've got the Pacers who are just below them. So based on those those two guys, probably DeRozan's the first one I eliminate. I'm putting in Brunson. Yeah, um, I think, you know, that's probably my biggest one out east. They're seventh, 28 and 26. They're, they're playing solid basketball, two tough losses the last two games. But um, I just think that, you know, he's been a big reason why they're so steady and they're, they're becoming a bit more consistent. So that that's one that I look at that's glaring. The other one is De'Aaron Fox. Mm -hmm. And look, Lillard would be – Lillard and SGA are the ones for me. Lillard's had a hell of a month though. He's, he's, he's had that 60-point game and he's he's pushed Portland from like they were 12, 13 to, to 8. So I get I get that one. I'm okay with that one under that context. SGA, they're 12th. They're 12th. They're not a great team. They're not really – you know, they're okay. They, they win some games. They're still developing. Darren, I mean, the Sacramento Kings are, are in third position, pro, and they deserve two All-Stars, in my opinion. I think those two are the only ones I can really argue. Trey Young wouldn't put him in. Some people say Edwards, but Minnesota, to me, they're playing better basketball now, but he's he's a snub for me, and I think a fair snub. I mean, who do you take out instead of him? Um, Booker, he's been hurt. Davis, he's been hurt. The Lakers suck. Butler, Miami haven't been as good as they've been previously. He hasn't been as good numbers-wise. Siakam. Toronto suck. So I think they all make sense. But yeah, my two big ones are De'Aaron De Fox and Brunson, I think, are the two that I would change, bro. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, I think that that makes sense with those two guys. Look, I thought Brunson was going to be in. Um, but yeah, I thought Brunson was going to be in. And Fox, I mean, they had a really good year for sure. Um, the only thing about like your pick on that, I mean, you're saying SGA not in and then SGA shouldn't be in and he should be in. Is that what you're saying in your opinion because of the seating? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't put SGA in. I, I base, you know, I base a lot of my all stars on you got to at least have a winning record. Like if you're if you're if, if you're jumping in over someone else, similar numbers. All right, SGA's numbers are better, but your team's not that good. I just can't put you in. But basically, if you're, I mean, you can make the same argument about Zion now because New Orleans has fallen out. But I think if you're if you're if you're below a plane and you're I just can't put you in. You need you need to be you need to be showing me a little bit more to be an all star. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I I'm so jaded with this all star game deal, but um, I, I do think the way Sacramento's playing, I mean, having a couple all stars in wouldn't hurt for sure. And look, those guys definitely got in. I mean, those guys guys definitely should have had their day in court to get in. Um, I. You know, in in some ways, I'd probably go Brunson over over Randall to be honest with you with the Knicks. Like, and I, and Randall's had a hell of a year. Don't get me wrong, but uh, well, you can't because it's a three forward, th uh, yeah, two guards, right. three forwards, right? You're right, yeah. So yeah. For, for I looked it yeah, up for that deal. You're right. So I right. don't know, man. This is why, like, all star to me. I don't like the game, but like when we're talking about players getting selected and people getting snubbed, I mean, everybody's really good. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna plead ignorance on this. Did DeRozan get in? You said that's yeah. shocking. Yeah, that is shocking. Look, I'm a DeRozan fan, but yeah, I would have probably put one of those other guys in um, instead of DeRozan. To be honest, DeRozan had a good year, but you know, if you're talking about teams that are underperforming for sure, like it's one thing. It's one thing on the West if you're talking about Oklahoma City. Now they're supposed to be tanking, and they're still actually playing hard. And and they're, you know, I, I wouldn't say they're underperforming. I would say they're just sort of doing what people expect them to do. About where they should yeah, be. Yeah, where where the mm -hmm. Bulls now they've had injuries of Ball not playing all year, um, but they've got Levine and DeRozan and and uh, Vucevic. I mean, they still have enough to to do really well and to you know and to be sitting there at 24 and 27. Same reason I don't put Anthony Davis in. Yeah, you know he's he's been injured, but. Um, yeah, you know they're, they're 12, 13 in the West. Like I just can't put a, a forward or a, or a center that's playing for a winning team above that. So I, I I slide more towards wins. I know a lot of people are different. Um, obviously LeBron gets in no matter what on, on a shitty team, but you know you're in that danger of of you know if you are a, a really bad team, like you take the Houston Rockets. If one of these young fellows next season averages 30, 10, and eight, you're putting him in with a record of twenty five wins. Yeah. You know it's because. They're hollow stats, in my opinion. You know, you can really inflate your stats on shitty teams, especially when you're in a development period. And I would argue this, OKC, once they become a better team, let's say they become a top eight, top six team, hopefully next season or the season after, I think every, every one of their numbers will take a hit. That's just my, my, my theory oh, because sure. 
they're gonna yeah they're gonna have to bring in another another veteran or two. They're gonna probably have to bring in some more shoot, whatever they're bringing in, and, and you got to share the load to be a winning team. It's not gonna be SGA. Even Giddy probably won't have the same numbers he's having once they become a consistent winning team. He'll he'll be a much better basketball player because he's gotten better, but I don't think his numbers are gonna continue to go to the level they're going. And that doesn't mean he's got worse. It just means you've got more players around you to play. It's similar to the Luka Doncic thing. Like when they finally get some help, whether they make some trades or not, his numbers will probably go down, but you'll see the win column tick over. And, and that's kind of what I feel with bad teams. You can really kind of inflate your numbers for all-star votes. Yeah, and to be honest with you, if you're going to have um, if you're going to have statistical floors for, you know, games played percentage-wise for, you know, uh, statistical leaders, why not have it for... All stars, you know, like Anthony Davis. Hey, nothing to take away from Anthony Davis. Twenty-seven and twelve, get it? I mean, the guys, you know, number wise. If you're not looking at the game wise, you're looking at somebody who's averaging twenty-seven and twelve. Nothing to shake a stick at. But he's played fifty-five percent of his games. So it's like I think there should be mm-hmm. a seven. If you're going to put seventy percent on the points leader, I think you need to put seventy percent on on making the All Star team. And and I think I, to me, like I said, I, that's a good one. Yeah, that'll make people play. Yeah, that'll make people play. But bonuses won't then be counted. Yeah, don't worry about all your bonuses. You want to be an all star, you got to play seventy percent. I like that. Yeah. That's fair. I mean, that's fair, right? Like I think seventy percent is a good baseline on everything, on all your stats, all your all NBA teams, all this. You got to be a certain percentage. And to be honest with you. If you want to we go in our load management talk, I would even up it for the MVP race. You want to win MVP, you got to go 82% or more of your games or something like that. Like, look, like, hey, look, a guy wants to win MVP, he's got to play every day. Or not every day, but he's got to play. You know, you can't be you can't be sitting in these things making all-star teams at 60%, 55%. I'd go 70. But, yeah, like, I see, like, Jay Williams, like, getting all emotional about Fox not making it and stuff. I never get mad about snubs. Yeah, we could have a discussion about it. I, I Like, look, you're an all-star, you're an all-star. I think all those guys from snubs to people who made it deserve to be in the all-star game. And I think it's a good talk. You know, it's like you're all top 20 list of all time. You know, like, hey, look, you think this, I think that. Um but there's no way we're ever going to get a perfect way to select this thing. You know, but I do think that the percentage of game definitely should be in there. But like we talked about last week of media selecting, um, player selecting, fan selecting. It's a joke. People don't take it serious. A lot of people don't see everybody else. There's really no, you know, there's really no great way to do it. But I think there definitely needs to be some baseline of it. Like, do you put winning percentage down there? Do you put your team's got to win 40%, like 45% of the games that you can't be an all-star? Like, do you put that on there? I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But I definitely think there should be a games played percentage-wise, in my opinion. Well, I think style of play as well is affected. Like, when you're on a bad, shitty team like Houston, who just gave up, where they give up 140-odd points, so they want to play that loosey-goosey, mm-hmm. fast-paced style like your, your your stats are inflated on bad teams you look at the good teams that actually guard and, and value possessions more they're probably ppgs are, 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 you know not across the board but probably not a score not scoring it much as much at times so i think that helps as well and just looking at Jokic's numbers to solidify your argument the last two seasons he's won mvp he's played in the 70s um both seasons and right now he's played 45 out of 52 so he's on pace to play 70 all three seasons while he's in MVP contention. Um, and Bede's much less than that. Giannis is similar to uh, to Jokic where he generally plays 70-odd games. So I, I like that as well and I think it, it makes it a little bit fair. But um, everyone's different. Some people will say, well, it's not, It's not. you know, for superstars on a bad team, it's not his fault. It's like, well, yes, to an extent. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, they should, you know, yeah. people say that the, the Mavs aren't, aren't a great team, right? Right now they need help. Luka needs help. Luca's numbers are off, off off the charts, but he's he's still got his team in contention. They're still they're still in the mix, and that's my point. At least if you're if you're an all star and or an MVP candidate, your team needs to at least be in the mix. And my argument for DeRozan is, yeah, they're ninth, but I mean they're not in the mix. They they don't have a serious chance of getting out of probably even a playing game. So that's kind of my my argument there, as is yours, and I think it's a fair yeah. one. So I'm interested to hear everyone's thoughts around that. If, if you're a player on a shitty team putting up big numbers, hollow numbers, should you be in contention for All Star? Is it is it fair or, See, or, or over a player that's you know led their team to a third, fourth in their conference? So I think, Bogues, this is a part of how to reform the league without really putting like big sort of pressures for players to play. But I think you have to put 
like healthy pressure to play. I would say no All Star, no MVP, no All NBA, unless you're forty six percent. You win forty six percent of your games, and you play you play a certain percentage of games. And I would say upwards of seventy. If you don't do those two things, you can't do it. Do you think team? You think players would be sitting out as much? You know, not impacting their teams like team wins against you know shittier teams to make sure they're going to win more games, make sure they play in more games without saying okay, like instead of saying well, it's a, a bigger bonus for you if you don't play these some of the games. That's bullshit. You can never get that through. But like, if I'm an NBA player. And even if I'm not an all star, but but like thinking I I you know I got to be at least eligible for all these things. I think you need to put a percentage of games played, and I think you need to put I think you need to put percent a winning percentage down there as well. Now that could affect small market and bad teams in free agency, where team you know players that want to miss out on these awards if they go to a shitty team and take more money on a shittier team. But I, I think that this is the only way you're going to get these players to play in more games. And, you know, look, we, there's always the other side of the argument saying they shouldn't have to get put this carrot in front of them for players should want to play anyway. We don't, that's not reality. But I think if you start putting, you know, you start tying these things, not, I mean, it's like money, but it's not money up front. It's money on these making all star teams and all NBA teams and things. You got to play in a certain amount of games and your team's going to win a certain amount. I would say 46% of your games you got to win. Which, you know, look, you don't have to be on a 500 team, but you got to be battling for 500 or you, you can't be in on – you're out of all of this stuff, in my opinion. And, and I don't know if that helps or hurts, but in my opinion, I think it starts like putting a little bit of, you know, a, put a sense of urgency of some of these players playing in these games because out of selfishness, you know, they, they want to play. And, you know, it's not really a team sport anymore. It's more individualized stats and social media. So, hey, look, if, if that's the way to get these guys to play more and not to sit out, you know, and I'm not saying I'm not saying hurt sit out. I'm saying just sit out for load management on that instead of saying, hey, look, I need to play. I need to play a few more of these games. I think that's that's a one step in the right direction these guys could take to, you know, to maybe try to get this thing a little bit back and a little bit on the on the right track. Yeah, that's fair enough. I think everyone agrees with that. I'm interested to hear what our listeners think. All right, moving on to the scuffle pro real quick. We don't get into this too much, but there was a mm-hmm. two scuffles. There was Donovan Mitchell and um, Brooks that we spoke about earlier. I don't have to get into that. Mm-hmm. But there was another one uh, in Orlando, Minnesota Timberwolves, Austin Rivers, and, and your guy, Mo Bamba. Jesus um, Christ. Somehow got into it. Mo, Mo Bamba's on the bench. Um, I've done a little bit of research on it. I haven't got a full story, but apparently – on one of Austin Rivers' corner threes, you know, every for context, every team in the in the NBA, their bench barks at guys that shoot corner threes. I hate it. I think it's, it's everyone says I'm oh, part of the game, but you know, there's guys waving towels, guys making noises. It's just I hate that part of it because you're so close to the bench. But anyway, uh, he basically what he what he said pro apparently was my Bamba said as he missed the three, he said this isn't this isn't high school anymore mm-hmm. uh, to Austin Rivers, which is interesting because I don't even think they played. You know, no high school in the same era no. to have that. Austin Rivers has been in the league what 10, 10 plus years mm-hmm. now, and Bumba's what third year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Austin Rivers took exception to it. Um, next play down, he went 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 out there bench by himself. Scuffling sued. Uh, my Bumba threw a few punches, missed uh, a nice tackle by um, Suggs, I believe it was on yeah, Austin Rivers. That. Had him in a headlock, um, but it's. I mean, I don't know. It then carries on to off the court into an Instagram war. <laughs> These two guys are going at it on Instagram. You know, I'm about that life. No, you're not. I know who you are. I run Orlando. You don't. Blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And Austin Rivers basically saying, I'm from Orlando. No one even likes you, Mo Bamba. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just, that's the era of social media. That's the era of the NBA. You, you said it a couple of weeks ago. It's the WWE or you called it the WWF, which doesn't exist anymore, mm-hmm. but we love it. Um, and, it just it just never gets old, man. It's just it's just uh, to these guys like, what are you doing? You know, like the, the, no one's. I mean, credit to Bamba for actually trying to throw a punch um, because he usually doesn't get to that point. But just a nothing scuffle between two bad teams that you know, and then Minnesota end up getting getting two or three guys ejected. They lose the game, an important game for them in Orlando to a team that you know we we've spoken about Orlando play. Play as hard as anyone for a bad team, but a game you should win. You know, if you're serious about making making the playoffs in the West, and they drop that game, and it just—I don't know what your thoughts are on it. It's uh, it's just it's just becoming 
you know, days of our lives, young and the restless, bold and the beautifulish, and that's becoming the NBA. Is this is this Orlando's like second or third like bench clearing brawl this year, isn't it? Like they've they've had a few, haven't they? They had the one. Yeah, in the Euro kid. What's his name? Uh, the, uh, um, yeah, Wagner. Uh, right? What's his name? The brother. Wagner. Uh, Wagner, yeah, Wagner. Wagner. <laughs> Did he, do we ever figure out whether he got knocked out or not? Uh, we have <laughs> not. We have not. But it was uh, it was mm. a little rough there for a while. Uh, look, this whole fake tough guy thing in the NBA is pretty comical, right? Like you said, at least Mo Bamba got a fight, a, a, a punch. You know, he got a punch in. Whatever. I guess you could say that's uh, that's progress or something. I don't know. Like you know what? Again, you know, if you're gonna turn on the WWF. Like, when two players get in a fight, you eject them both, and you put them in a little glass cage where they fight for, like, four minutes straight. And then fans can gamble on it. Like, put it right on the on, on the baseline, like, eight feet off the court, and let those guys fucking go at it. No, seriously, though. It's a fucking... It is what it is. And then Austin Rivers with this Instagram war. Like, fight it out. Like, look, load and dock. Here it is. Let's go. Fight. If, that, if that's what they want to do, if that's what you want to do, you know, I don't know, man. Like, for and, and second of all, Austin Rivers, a spell check needs to work or you just put Duke on academic probation. Teammates, two words, choked, C-H-O-C-K-E-D. I mean, come on, man. Like, if you're going to rip somebody on social media, spell the shit right. I know. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking ridiculous. Look. Are you claiming Austin didn't go to class? Uh, Is that what you're claiming? Yeah, for? I mean, Duke cheated enough back then, you know, in, in, in Krzyzewski's tenure. But, you know, uh, they might put get on academic probation after seeing that stuff, man. He needs to, he needs to like, <laughs> he really needs to start double-checking his shit. Especially if you're going to be emotional about it and put everything in the caps and stuff. You, you got to you oh, so easy shit. on your phone, man. When you spell shit wrong, the little red line pops up and yeah. you press it, it tells you how to spell it. There's no no excuse Shocked. these days. I mean, yeah. mistype, mistype, different story. I have a battle with that with fat fingers, as I'm sure you do. Oh, that, that's, um, like, that, that's a different story. But like blatant mistypes. Maybe but, teammates, uh, maybe like, it was just one space. He, he put team and then mates. But my bullshit meter's up, and I think that he definitely thought teammates spelt with two words instead of one. That's just my opinion. But look, man, it is what it is, dude. It's, you know, every, everybody gets a little emotional. Everybody's a telephone tough guy. You know, they're, they're tough on social media, whatever. But they're not really that. I'm not saying physically tough, but I'm just saying they're very sensitive on stuff. I mean, but, like, here's my thing on the whole fight. So Mo Bamba starts it. This ain't high school anymore. And then punches the guy later, right? Like another possession or two later or whatever it was. Like did 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 Austin say anything back to him before the punch and before like the whole melee happened? I'm not sure. I mean, it just looked like he went to the bench and was just like, what, what do you have to say? Yeah. You know, why are you talking smack? No, and, then, he, and then I think Bamba. Yeah, I think, yeah, he got off the bench. I thought it was like during the game. Bamba stood up in his face. Yeah. yeah, he got up and got in his face. And then that's when Austin said, I, I let no man stand in my face, blah, blah, I think blah. The but, NBA, um, I think the NBA, they need to do it. I, I think just to start, just to keep this whole theme of being a circus, just have them like, seriously, two guys get in a fight, just put them in the cage for five minutes. You <laughs> can gamble on it. And like, and then there's like a judge, like a celebrity, like ex players could be celebrity judges, and then you gamble on that. I'm telling you, folks, it's twice, two weeks in a row that we reformed the NBA. I think I think we're onto something. Seriously, get in a fight. It's like the it's like hockey, but you gamble on it. Just five straight minutes. I remember a col- in a college, a Boston College did this. A senior was fighting a freshman, like well, not start like starting shit and talking shit with the freshman. And this freshman guy was really tough. Like, really tough. Finally, the head coach got fucking sick of it. He said, fuck this. Shut the doors. And he just said, let them go at it. The freshman fucking chased the guy around the gym because the senior wanted nothing to do with him. <laughs> I think that anybody who gets into a tussle like that, where, like, has to be separated, throw him in the glass cage, let him fight it out five minutes, and then they back back to the bench and they can maybe even play. If they're conscious, they can play. But I think that, that's how you sort these guys I don't want better pro, so... University of Utah under Rick Majerus. Yeah. Um, whenever there was tussles at practice like that about, you know, let's go, let's go, let's go, there was gloves. Uh, they got rid of it once I got there, um, but there was gloves yeah. and they would they would get the gloves and you guys would go at it. Um, and they stopped doing it after a guy got knocked out cold. <laughs> 
Both. <laughs> there was like a, there's a guy named Trace Caden on the team back then. They did they did some sessions in the weight sessions. They did some boxing, and yeah, he, he was a he was an intangibles type player, like tough guy, not not voice tough guy, an actual tough dude, yeah. just a tough, quiet dude. And they put him in the ring with this one guy, just knocked him out clean cold. And then Majerus was like, All right, we're gonna we're gonna have gloves now if you guys want to. You know, fight, blah, 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 blah. And then after the knockout, they were like, yeah, we can't, we can't be having players get knocked out from punches. Folks, I'm tired of, I'm, if you're going to fight, fight. Like, I don't want it. Look, you know, David Stern was good about this. Like, he wanted to clean that stuff up. It was a little bit too much, right? Fighting in front of benches up. But like, it, oh man, in the 80s, yeah. you just had like, you just had guys just haymaker and people. Yeah. So <laughs> like, if you want to yeah. do it, fight. Forget about because you know this. Ninety eight percent of fights, everyone knows you're going to get held back by twenty seven guys. Hey, how about that other guy? The same guy that held back Stephen Adams from the Memphis staff for the um the probably the security had to like get in this melee with Mitchell, but that's a sec- separate uh, uh, thing. But we know like ninety eight percent of fights in the NBA, you know you're going to get held back. They know that just that what they want to do it. Because they're going to be on social media, people are going to be talking about it. They know there's going to be no fight. They're just like, oh, you know, starting it up, and then everybody's going to be held back if there's no fight. I'm saying if you're going to go there where there's going to be a scuffle, put them in a fucking ring, let them fight to the side. I'm telling you, five minutes. You want to, hey, you want to up the ratings of the NBA? Imagine how great that is. Like one guy wants to fight another, just put him in the fucking cage. Five minutes in and out, and they get to play back. I'm in. I know. I mean, this yeah, never ha- it would never happen. But I, I like the no, thinking. But I think the That's first step the NBA is going to have, first step the NBA is going to have is Mo Bamba is going to cop a suspension. Oh, four games. It's already done. Oh, it's already done. There you go. Which is fair enough. As soon as you leave the bench and you engage, I think they, like I said, they need to go harder on all the shit talking from the bench. You know, um, especially with shooters in the corner, where the referee should just be like, "Hey, we're not, we're not, we're not doing that anymore." Remember, there was a, the co- a coach that you know was at Vanderpool that put his Vanderpool. hand out or did something. Um, yeah, so they, look, anything in front of the bench, you're trying to affect the shooter, you know, we're, we're going to try to stamp it out because we don't want, you know, say something offensive and then this happens and, I mean, there's the argument of the player should take it in stride and it's just words, but we know the players aren't going to do that and it's going to escalate and it ends up being this. But um, enough of that. Steph Curry just got hurt, by the way. Oh, uh, just limped out of the Dallas game. He will not return, so hey, cool. hopefully that's not too bad. It was a knee-on-knee, a knee-on-knee oh. um, knee with uh, a Dallas Mavericks player. Um, who I've not heard of really. Uh, what's his name? Something right. Um, but let me look it up real quick. But yeah, it looked like a knee to knee, and he looked like his knee might have might have somewhat given out and buckled a little bit. So they they said their X-rays are negative, but you know, every NBA team says their X-rays are negative because you're not usually hurting a bone. That's definitely not a bone injury. Uh, they won't know till the MRI comes in. McKinley, right, right yeah. the fourth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so ran into him. I mean, not his fault. He's just trying to go to the baskets and um, took out Steph's front leg and has returned. So that'll that'll definitely change things. The Warriors were starting to starting to find it a little bit, uh, starting to play a little bit better and and, and in the mix there. And um, they're still in tenth and they're exactly five hundred. So this this could hurt them a little bit if he's out for another month or two. Um, you got to obviously have a lot of other guys step up. All right, off to trade. Rumors, pro. So the Kyrie is gone. Um, pro, I don't, I don't really blame him this time around, man. Like the Boston one, yes. You know, maybe Cleveland, yes. But but this one, I mean, Joe Sy was on record for almost a year straight about, you know, with the back stuff. I'm not extend, we're not extending him. We're not giving him an extension. You know, I told every man and dog and woman that would listen. And now all of a sudden, you know, Kyrie said, okay, if you're not going to extend me, I want out. Trade me somewhere that, um, He's going to want to extend me. So for people out there who don't know how this works, Kyrie's deal is expiring at the end of the season. He wants to do an extension. The way this works is generally agents will be in touch with teams that are potential trade suitors and they'll already be discussing, hey, if Kyrie accepts a trade to you guys, um, will you guys do the extension? That's already negotiated before the trade happens just for people with peace of mind. Like it's generally not – they don't just send Kyrie somewhere and then – um, he goes there and they're like, we, we don't want to extend you. We just want you for the three months or four months, right? It's it's already pre-negotiated, generally speaking. But uh, some backtracking from Brooklyn was they offered him an extension with championship incentives, which is, I mean, ridiculous. No one really has championship incentives from max extensions these days. Um, you can have bonuses, but not, not incentives that they're probably getting to the full figure. 
Um, then they went on to say after that, oh, no, no, we're still willing to negotiate an extension anyway. So I blame Brooklyn for this. So I think Brooklyn's messaging is just more trying to save face about losing a max player. Um, and the history is there. Look, the Kyrie ship was sailed between Kyrie and the organization a year or ago. So I don't really blame Kyrie in this circumstance. I think he's well in his right to ask for a trade and leave. I don't believe Brooklyn's side of the story about, oh, no, we tried to offer him and he just doesn't want to be here. Like, yeah, maybe so, but you had your opportunity and I think you squandered that and the owner squandered that, so big mistake. But some new suitors have popped up. The Lakers were the early ones. The Lakers are basically in any true trade rumors these days. Um, but the, the Mavs, your Mavs have popped up pro. Um, apparently, Finney Smith is one of the deal breakers that the Mavs don't want to do, but I think they do it if it comes down to it. Phoenix Suns are in there. They need any help they can get the way they're playing. And just now, the Clippers have emerged, Pro. That's an interesting one. I think the Clippers probably have the most assets available um, to make a good deal. You know, John Wall and Powell and Covington. They've got, they got some good, First good of players all, that can those, help. Those aren't fucking assets. Mm. Besides Powell, those ain't fucking assets. <laughs> get, get the fuck out of here. More than the other three teams. I mean, what, okay, Suns. Who are they giving up? If you're Phoenix. Crowder? If you're Phoenix because, they, you know... I would say Aiton. Landau? Well, they can't do Aiton. Oh, fuck. You know, exactly. Yeah. So, they're, okay, there goes Suns. Mavs, who are they giving up? What, Dinwiddie and Hardaway Jr.? Yeah. <laughs> like, and the Lakers, what, Westbrook? Yeah, no. So, out of, out of those four teams, in my opinion, I think the Clippers arguably have more assets to get more, I guess, instant help than those other three teams, in my opinion. Um, I just don't think those other three teams have much. I mean, Westbrook, could, could help Brooklyn a little bit, has played with KD before, but they're the four teams that have been that have been talked about and you would assume, you know, off, would the Mavs extend Kyrie? We know Cubes doesn't like to go too far over that cap, so I don't know. They're the four teams, bro. Folks, here's my thing with this whole deal. And, and to be honest, like earlier today, I sort of started going your direction with this. Like... Um, I don't really blame them. I didn't really go into the whole negotiation, but look, this is a business. And when I say that, I don't say it like NBA players say it and they have no fucking idea why they say it. I'm saying because each player individually, let's cut the shit. You're trying to, you're not trying to win. You don't give championships. They're just extra. You're trying to get as much money for you and your family that you can get and, and get it throughout your whole career. In most cases, not all, but I would say a, a, a majority of the cases. So you got to look out for yourself. I mean, that's just forget about the family, team, all that. It's all bullshit. And he's trying to look out for himself. And look, is that the right thing morally to do? I don't know. I'm not the fucking judge and jury on that. But he's just trying to get in, and he's try, and he knows that if he puts it out now, a few days before trade deadline, he could get to the Lakers because I think this is all about going to LA. I don't think it's about going anywhere else but LA for a million different reasons. Right. And and that's the thing. If I'm Brooklyn, you fuck this thing up with Harden as it is. You traded for one of the most mentally weak players in the history of mankind in Ben Simmons when you didn't really have to. You were going through a rough patch and Harden says, oh, whatever. You know, look, at the end of the day, Harden wants to play and he wants to compete. Does he want to win whatever? I don't know, but he wants to play. And they fucked this thing up by like jumping the gun instead of holding this thing out and being like, look, dude, let's play together. Durant's coming back. We still get a chance. We're going to win a championship. You want to leave the summer? Great. We'll, we'll, we'll get you to a place. Instead, they ended up trading for Ben Simmons, which is one of the worst history, worst trades in the history of mankind. You got a guy that doesn't want to compete, right? Now you have this trade deal. Any of these trades are going to knock you out, right? Like you go to LA. First of all, you, you're, you're done if you trade with LA because you, you're going to get these two picks. You're going to get Westbrook. It's going to be, it's not going to be a good fit. And Westbrook's not going to do what Kyrie Irving is doing for them. And they're not going to win. I don't know what Durant's going to want to do after that. Does he leave? Does he not? Whatever. But it's going to knock you out. Those two picks, they may or may not be worth something. Like, even if they, you take the protection off. Because if you take the protection off, that, like, what if the Lakers end up, like, 
you know, keeping LeBron, getting a couple more free agents, doing okay, 50 wins, 55 wins, and now those picks are like 20, whatever, 19, 20, 21, and you're not getting anything great out of them, right? So that's it. You go to Phoenix, uh, maybe Bridges is in the deal. Maybe that would make it worth it. I don't think they would want to put Bridges in the deal, but whatever, right? You go to the Mavericks, right? You get Dorian Finney-Smith, you get, you know, you get a pick, you get this. Like, that's a good deal, but that's, I mean, you're losing out Kyrie Irving to, you know, and then Dorian comes in, who's a great def- elite defender, decent shot maker, but that's not really putting you over the championship, at, you know, like that's that makes KD happy because he wants to play with Dorian from what I've heard. So that's great. But like, okay, so any of these trades, they're okay. You get some capital back. Like Kyrie, it's not like Luka wanting to leave Dallas. It's not like Bam Adebayo wanting to leave Miami where they're coveted players where 30 teams want them, 30 teams will max them out. Kyrie, in my opinion, only has value in a, a few certain places because of the money he wants, because of all the antics he pulls. You know, and, and ironically enough, I think he's playing some of the best basketball in his career the last couple of weeks, the last three weeks or so. He's playing great. Uh, but like... If I'm Brooklyn Bogues, I'm saying, look, we're not trading you, all right? We're not trading you. You want to leave? We're just going to, like, look, you want to leave, we. But we fucked this thing. I'm not going to tell them this, but we fucked this thing up as it is. Let's just finish this thing out. Win us the championship, do whatever, and then we'll talk in the summer. We'll talk in July, like right around free agency time. If this could be rekindled, it gets rekindled. If not, let's just go. Because what are you going to get back? You're going to get back a couple of picks, Westbrook. The problem is they get yeah, you get nothing. He walks, back. they get nothing. But that, folks, and then the, the whole cap issue. If you trade for like for like, it fits into your cap, correct? Like if you just go on, if Kyrie walks, you free up some cap space. But I'm guessing there's different provisions with signing a free agent, true, right? But so, but folks, like let's be honest. Yeah. If Westbrook comes back to the team in, in LA, right? And then they're going to want, from what I've heard, LA wants a, a role player too. So you're talking about bringing Harris back out. So that's a big part of their team. Mm. Like, folks, to me, like these NBA free, you know, GMs, they'll, they'll make terrible poker players because they fold in fucking two seconds. All right? They fold in two seconds. Dude, look, and, and, this, and he may really want to leave. But there's like five more months. You know how many times players is demanded trades and then it just sort of why? Yeah, and it just sort of works out. Like sometimes it works out, mostly it doesn't, mostly the guy leaves. But like say, look, dude, if you want to leave, just leave. But like I get it. Like, and I understand leaving for nothing. But look, in trade, look at these trades you can get. Like I love Dorian Finney-Smith. He's probably my favorite player in any of these players being talked about as far as trade for trade. But for them, it's like if you get him and it doesn't work, you don't know what KD's going to do, right? And I'm not going to answer and say, well, KD's going to do this because I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I don't know. have any information on KD, so I don't know. But, like, you make the Lakers t- t- deal, you're fucked. You make the Phoenix deal, depending on who's in it, you know, you, you, you're pretty much fucked there. Unless it's like, I don't think it could be Aiton, but maybe it can be. I don't know. But like, if it's Aiton, but you already have a five that's doing pretty well, whatever. But like, to me, I'm just saying, look, let's finish the year. Because it's either like, finish the year, try to win this thing. But if we trade and we bring back lesser players, and it's just like... A, a longer deals. Yeah, yeah, it's a hodgepodge of stuff. If... Say Katie decides to leave, now what do you have? Well, that's a, that's a follow up, right? That's a follow up. So it's like Katie, he's probably going to be healthy to all probably post the All Star. Yeah. What does he do? Does he ask for a trade in the next couple of days? I mean, it's, there's every possibility because they're there. You know, you lose Harris and, and Kyrie. Okay, you get Russ back. Like you're not moving the needle. No, you kind of you know you're going to be maybe a playing team um, if you fall that low. But I think Kyrie's gone. I, I don't think they'll do it. I think they'll, I don't think yeah, they'll keep I him. Um, I think just – and I, I think in fairness to to the GM, I think this was done by the owner. Like you showed your hand a year ago when you said – made these comments publicly. Why would you – okay, yeah, it was political at the time, the back stuff, all the back – just just shut the fuck up. Like be quiet, man. You, you basically – you've given Kyrie – on a platter to any team in the league right now. How many billion? Because they know, they know. You got you got no leverage whatsoever. It's like, okay, yeah, we're, we're screwing you on this trade, but do you, do you want to take the risk of keeping an unhappy Kyrie around that group right now and 
by all means, go for it. So I think Joe Sire's got a lot to answer for as, as an owner. You know, most owners keep quiet for that very reason in the NBA. And I think he's hurt the front office by making those comments. Um, you know, Kyrie might have still wanted to leave. He's still pissed off with the Vax thing. He didn't get, didn't get support from the Nets, all that kind of stuff. Get it. But I don't think his comments helped at all. And, and yeah, the follow-up is that KD is the elephant in the room, right? It's like he, he kind of asked for a trade earlier this season, then walked it back. When Kyrie was back on, it's like, okay, so what, what, where's that going to go now, man? It's But in saying that, you know, I think a, a, a Dallas or even a Miami who hasn't come up, um, he could Kyrie could really help those two teams. <laughs> like you put you put Kyrie next to as long as you're not giving up the farm, if you can you, you can swindle some sort of good deal. I mean, I don't think he's moving the needle much for the Lakers. I think the Lakers, you know, with the LeBron circus around the scoring title, he's going to want to try to not only eclip, not only get that but eclipse it. ADs in and out. Uh, they just don't look like a cohesive group. They're not playing well together, and they should be much better than they are. Suns is kind of the same. I mean, yes, he, he, I think he definitely provides some help there, but then you're taking the ball out of CP3's hands and we know that's not going to happen. Um, not easily anyway. Clippers is the other interesting one. I think the Clippers and Clippers, Mavs and, and Heat would be the three teams that if he goes to, I think he can, he can really help them make that jump to, to a championship. Or, you know, for the Mavs, probably not as much, maybe a conference finals, but the Clippers and even Miami, I think people think it's crazy, but you put him there and you don't lose too much. I think they got a really good chance to to then establish themselves as conference finalists again. The, so the problem, um, the problem we'll, goes, folks. Though, like Kyrie isn't all in. You know, he's not on. He hasn't been all in on any team he's been on. You know, he plays. Don't get me wrong, but like that's the thing. If you're an organization that just wants him, and because of his talent, and that's okay, and you're going to deal with the other stuff, and you're going to turn your head to it, great. But like, he, there's been antics everywhere he's been. You know, Cleveland at the end, Boston basically the whole time there. You know, he's there's been antics multiple times in Brooklyn. But like, look, if you're if you're willing to turn your head, there's leverage now, pro. He's a free agent. There's leverage. I, don't I think- mean, you go, you go and act the fool on one of these teams. Yeah, you know. Yeah, going into free agency, I wouldn't extend him if I signed. I would. I would if I was one of these teams, I'd say, look. If you if you you know finish this season off for us right, we'll extend you. We'll give you our word. We're going to give you an extension, but we want to see that you're committed and, and you don't do anything foolish for at least the next you know three four five months. Get us to a conference finals or a finals. Um, so there's some there's some leverage there, and I think if he if, if he does mess around and then goes to free agency, it's going to hurt his value. He's not going to get that max. You know, he's always going to get a two year two year max instead of a four year, and he wants that four year apparently. The only team that does it, in my opinion, that should do it is the Lakers. First of all, financially, it doesn't matter because they they can afford it, and secondly. It it will get almost guarantee you that you know LeBron will probably stay and you know all that stuff and then you're gonna win fifty plus games a year. Those picks aren't gonna be worth as much as they think they're gonna be worth. You know down the line maybe, but like at least now you've got. I mean, imagine a team if they could stay healthy with AD, LeBron, and Kyrie. And look, I don't think they're still any good. Like I don't think they're gonna be a great team because they don't have the supporting cast. But like. I'm at, like, if I'm the Lakers, I'm making this work. The Clippers, um, you know, like if I'm, if I'm, if I'm really, you know, if I'm Brooklyn, yeah, like John Wall, like John Wall because he need a point guard, right? And he's been okay, averaging what eleven and five. Like Powell, Wall, they got no picks left because Sam Presti destroyed them with that in in their Paul George trade. So, Paul George, yeah, yeah. So like, so it'd be Wall Powell. Um, yeah, they say Covington probably just to make the the money work, you know. And I would probably even try to get maybe. Well, no, you got Joe Harris, so you don't need Luke Kennard. So like, it's something like that to me. But you got no picks, so I don't know where you're gonna get extra capital from. But like, if so, here's the two situations. For the other team that needs to make this deal are the Lakers. Needs, like, whatever they ask for. Like, you just give it to them. And I don't care what it is. 87 picks, whatever. Just get the deal done because you're not looking very good in the future. For the Brooklyn, probably the best trade you can make probably is going to be the Clippers if they're going to throw in. Like, to me, I'm going Powell, Wall, Terrence Mann, Covington, I'll throw you back something extra player to make the players work. But, like, I'm not making a deal without without Powell and, and Terrence Mann. 
Covington, take him or leave him. You know, Wall, take him or leave him. But like Powell and Terrence Mann for them uh, will be a really important because he's sort of like a Bruce Brown, like Bruce Brown played for Brooklyn. He's sort of like that type of player. And shit, I'll even, mm. you know, like, but the thing is, folks, there's not really a sense of urgency for 28 teams to trade for Kyrie. That's the thing. No, definitely not. No. 100%. Nobody no, no. really there's, wants there's, to deal with it. There's a, there's a group. There's a group that I've I've just mentioned yeah. that can, he can help them. Uh, Suns, I, I don't think he's moving the needle for. Um, Lakers, I don't even think he's moving the needle for that much. Um, Mavs, yes. Clippers, yes. Uh, Heat, yes. But he haven't even been reported he, in it yet. But and um, here's an outside ch- team, folks, to to keep an eye on. Washington for Bradley Beal. Now, Bradley Beal has got a no trade clause, so he's gonna have to waive that. Mm. But like, if I'm Bradley Beal. Like Washington's really not winning now. He might just be cool living there, and he he loves the organization and and all that. For Washington, they may not want to do it, but I don't know. Change things up. Sure, you put him in that lineup with uh, a half, you know, healthy mentally Ben Simmons yeah. with you know the shooting that they've got. Beal's a great two way player next to KD. Mm. Yeah, I like it. If they did that, I mean, they probably have to give up a little bit more than that. Probably lose Joe Harris and, and then someone else. But um, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It'll sneak in. And Beal's been Beal's been rumored numerous times about trying to form a big three. Um, I don't know if you call that that, that anymore with Brooklyn, but uh, two and a half. Uh, but mm-hmm. um, that'll be an interesting one. Yeah, I mean, that, that'll fit in really well with the way KD plays, and they get a great two way player. So, all right, enough of that. Move on. Matisse Thybulle's in. He wants out for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, Hasn't had a great year, hasn't played in and out of the rotation, hasn't had his, you know, probably his worst year as a pro. He's looking to get out. We're interested to see if someone someone picks him up. He could be very useful for some of these playoff teams. And, and the other one is Crowder. Now, Milwaukee and Phoenix had discussed a trade around, I think, Jordan Nawara, Serge Bucker, and a, and a throw in. Mm-hmm. And apparently it was agreed um, to Milwaukee will then, you know, Given permission to speak to, to Crowder about whether he wants to go there, and then it's thawed out. So mm. I guess the answer to that was no. <laughs> um, that was about five days ago, which I thought you know Crowder would be a, a really good pickup for Milwaukee. Um, be able to play him at the stretch four in the small ball lineups with Giannis at the five. I think it provides some good shoot. You know, he was a really good three point shooter a couple of seasons ago. So I think that'd be a really good um, pickup for Milwaukee if they can do it. But that's that is thawed out and. That's kind of it right now. Um, there hasn't been a lot pro of, of 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 trade rumors coming into this season's trade deadline, and they're the years that usually go bang, right? Um, I think last season was the most overhyped one we've, we've had in a number of years. Probably the last two seasons, we thought a lot was going to happen. All these max guys deals are coming up, Brooklyn deal, all this. Not a whole lot happened. There was one or two big trades, and that was it. Do you think this is a chance of this season just quietly going into a bang, or you think not much is going to happen? You know. It- you can never predict it, and, and I think there'll be a, a a lot of little movement. You know, getting off some cap stuff, you know, for luxury tax purposes, and then maybe somebody will will do a deal that you don't know about. I mean, that you didn't really see coming. A lot of times, the big ones don't really happen that way, but you never really know. Um, in my opinion, if I had a guess, I would say Danny Ainge will get off some players in Utah. I think, you know, and, and again, no information. Um, about this but i think jared vanderbilt he's a player that might be on the move you know because he's extent you know he, he's he's on his rookie deal looking for an extension jordan clarkson might be one just to sort of solidify the victor sweepstakes at the end there you know like guys like that maybe even you know rudy gay will probably stick around um but like i could see something like that happening where like he just you know mike conley might go somewhere you know, just to get off, just to just to get him somewhere else, and um, you know he's making twenty two million this year, so it's like, you know, and I think he's expiring. No, he's got one more year, twenty four three, um, after this one. So like, I could see like Ainge making some moves. Um, you know, I could see maybe Boston shoring something up and Milwaukee shoring something up. I'll be honest with you, if I'm Philly, I'm calling I'm calling Phoenix for Crowder. And, and shipping him Thibel and mm-hmm. something else. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like, you get a defender that you're going to play. You know, Doc will probably trust Crowder a little bit more with his shot making, even though he hasn't played all year. Like, you know, I could see something like that happen. The problem is they love PJ, man. They play PJ 30-plus minutes a game. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Like, Doc loves him, yeah. you know? So, similar positions, right? Yeah. You know, PJ can go to the three for a little bit, but predominantly a four. Yeah. 
Maybe. Um, but I, I agree. I think Crowder, Crowder, and Crowder can shoot the three above the break. You know, PJ is more of a defender and go stand in the corner and create space, whereas Crowder can hit those from from the top of the key in the wings. So and I think Poto. Um, I think a lot of a, a, yeah, a lot of teams can use Crowder. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, Poto's P- 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 been in rumors since day dot, right? Yeah, I think Poto is a guy. Look, I love Poto. I think like if I, I think I found the Mavericks. Like you know, I, I'm trying to get Poto because you know. He's big. He's big. He could. He could do some things like he, you know, he's a passer. He could. He. He. He's a shop. A little bit of a shop blocker. You could trust him. He's tough. Um, in my opinion, I'd probably try to do that. But I don't know. You know, like the Mavericks have been. You know, there's been some rumors about Christian Wood maybe going somewhere, but. I don't know, man. If I'm the map, what do you get back? Yeah, you're not getting like we yeah, talked about that. We, we, we discussed this a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. What are you getting back for Christian Wood that's going to move the needle for you? Right. Um, nothing. No. Like he's been solid for him, provides some offensive spacing for him like, next to Lucas. So, yeah. yeah, you're not you're not getting that back in the trade. Okay, yeah, he doesn't want to extend, doesn't he? But that's probably a case of the Kyrie discussion we had, where you just you know we're just going to keep it into the season and see how it goes. You know, you're not causing us problems really off the floor, so we'll keep you around. But. Um, that's basically it trade wise. It's interesting it's an interesting one leading into it. There's gonna be there's a lot of players that can you know, that are in, in the crowd abode, or Podal or, you know, Jordan Clarkson's another one that can, you know, some of these teams that are, you know, three, four, five, six can really shore up and get, you know, that can really, really help. So interested to watch um, how that all unfolds. Aussie watch. All right, we'll get through the injuries first. Ben Simmons, he's injured. Um he hasn't played this week, so not much from him there. DMPs. Josh Green still hurt, so <laughs> that injury is definitely gone over the course. Must be something, maybe something flared up, something more serious. I'm just speculating, but it wasn't only meant to be a couple of weeks, and it's been a while now. Dyson Daniels still out with that injured ankle, so not much there. Daly played one game this week for nine minutes, one assist versus the Pacers, and that was it for him. Uh, Paddy Mills, his best, probably one of his best, his best week of the season, in my opinion. Um, 12 points, 12.6 points, 1.6 assists, six for 15 from three, and a steal per game. So back in the rotation, kids. So all you, all you uh, people out there that aren't getting minutes with your junior teams or in and out, you don't know what's going on. He, um, he really stayed, he, he stays ready as a pro and he's come back and, after a month, basically, a month straight, basically, of, of DNP CDs when they were healthy with KD and Kyrie to now getting some minutes, and he'll see some more minutes with this uh, Kyrie deal. Jock Landale, another solid week for him. He's back in the rotation again like a yo-yo. Uh, 6.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, um, but good to see him back in the rotation. Matisse Thibel, um, not, not huge numbers, but his best week, six points, two rebounds, two steals a game, so... Um, he's had numerous weeks where he's, you know, 1.1 rebound, one steal. So he's 6 2 and 2 is a good start for him, especially with trade rumors heating up. Joe Ingles has probably had his worst week of the season uh, 3.6 points, 2.6 rebounds, 1.6 assists, 2 for 10 from 3. So a bit of a bit of a down week for old Joey, and he'll he'll definitely get those numbers back up. But uh, Josh Giddy again, another week, another dollar for him, another uh, Rogue Bows, Aussie of the week. <laughs> it's his eighth for those counting. He's got this reward locked up, but. 19 points, 8 rebounds, 8 assists, 2.3 steals per game for the week, if you don't mind. And Jack White is uh, – DNPs has not got any games for those wondering as well. So that's the Aussie wrap. Uh, I don't think anyone's getting close to Giddy, and I wonder when Ben Simmons will be back because they need him on the floor right now, especially with his trade rumors heating up. They're probably going to be depleted for a little while. And uh, Kyrie is – also, one thing we failed to mention is he was – quote unquote injured for today's game and was out with speculation leading he will not play another game for the Nets leading up to the deadline. So we'll see where that all goes. Moving on. Double copy bets. That is the double experience. Uh, the social betting experience where you can copy bets. It's simple. Uh, if you see a bet on your feed you like, boom, hit that copy bet button straight to your account. No questions asked. Follow, copy my bets and jump into banter. Uh, my username, Andrew Bogart, all one word. Go and download the app, the app store, double or one word. Have a double, double socially. You must gamble responsibly, pro. NBL Australia is kicking off. There's games going on right now as we do this podcast. Melbourne versus Adelaide uh, is going right now and Sydney play Perth after. So, pro, when they went to this top six, I wasn't a huge fan of it, but I got to give the league credit. It's made this last day of what would generally be somewhat nothing games if it was just for top four. Um, the dead rubber games essentially. It's made them exciting. So Melbourne play Adelaide right now. It is 72-70 for Melbourne. If Melbourne win uh, and Sydney beat Perth, Perth are out. 
um, and Sydney don't have anything to play for win-wise. Uh, it doesn't affect the Kings. They finish first no matter what, but that game's after this one. Uh, so basically if Melbourne win and Perth win, it then comes down to percentage and they're, they're one point apart, pro. So basically if Melbourne win by 10 and Perth win by nine, I believe Melbourne will be in uh, pretty much. So something along those lines. It's very, very intricate with percentage, but um, and Adelaide has an outside chance, but they would need to win this game against Melbourne by a lot. And doesn't look, Melbourne's up by two with five minutes left in the third. So credit to the league, pro. I was critical of the top six just because I thought diluting it a 10-team league to top six. But what it's done is it's made these last couple of games um, of the season very, very exciting and they actually matter. So when you can have that level of excitement towards the end of the season, no one wants to go to a game where you're you know, whether you're fifth and you have no chance of getting fourth, no one likes going to those games because they're just dead rubber games. And that's kind of why the NBA brought the playing in. So credit to the NBL there. Uh, New Zealand's locked up second. Cairns has, you know, locked up third. Perth were in a good position. They, um, they had to win their Friday night game two nights ago against Cairns. In Perth, Cairns severely depleted, a lot of injuries, and they just – absolutely got manhandled by Cairns in Perth on their home floor and lost that game, which hurt them. If they won that, they would have locked up a – pretty much locked up a spot in the playoffs. So it comes down to the old Sydney Kings pro to whether we uh, whether we go out there and give it a, a fair shot to try and win that game, which we're trying to do. Um, we can knock the uh, the Perth Wildcats out even if they beat us. So a lot, a lot going on today on the final day of the season, pro. Hey, Bogues. You know, it's always exciting coming down to it. I, I saw that you did post something about um, – about like I think the playoffs, the playoffs, sort of the amount of teams and things like that. So, hey, look, sometimes different formats are good. Sometimes they're not. I'm glad you like it. You know, it, anything that adds a little bit of excitement, you know, could be a, a decent deal. Definitely, and it just keeps, like I said, keeping teams engaged and fans and, and organizations late in late in seasons is always hard when you when you're out down and out, and that's what this top six has done. So congratulations to the NBL. I think it's been successful and it's created a lot of excitement. Tuesday night is the NBL awards night in Melbourne. I'll be you know going into that um, right now with with who I think will win the award. A little bit of bias, obviously being a king, but um, that's on Tuesday night. So that'll that'll be good. And then the planes start. Um, that week as well. So we'll figure out who the planes are and the Kings will commence the following week for their first round of the semifinals, which is best of three. So we'll figure all that out over the next couple of days. The awards MVP is the first one pro. It's down to Bryce Cotton, Mitch Creek and Xavier Cooks. Uh, This is tough. I mean, I value wins. So I look at these things differently. I run through the numbers. Xavier Cooks this season, 16 points, eight rebounds, Four and a half odd assists, sixty percent from the field. His numbers don't tell all. He, he affects the game in so many ways. He's one of the few players in the league that can comfortably switch one through five. He, you know, he's an anchor for us on offense. Runs a lot of stuff from from our split games and handoffs. Does a fantastic job, and we've got the best record in the league. Uh, Mitch Creek's numbers: twenty three points, seven rebounds a game at fifty percent shooting, two assists a game in there as well. Inflated numbers, I think, on a team that needed him to to, to obviously you know, uh, carry the load at times. Um, but they're, they're, you know, fifth, sixth, in my opinion. Um, their team's fifth or sixth. So I think, you know, in my opinion, with the MVP voting, you, your team at least has to be in the top four. That's just my opinion on it. That's why I side with Xavier. But Bryce Cotton's also had a, a fantastic year again. He's in the running every single season, but 24 points a night. Four and four assist rebounds, but forty-two percent from the field. A lot of his stuff comes from the line. Not shooting a great clip, but when Perth win, he he he's the one that leads them. But they also have a chance of missing the playoffs today, so they could finish seventh. So my thing is, I think you got to be in the top four to be a realistic shot for MVP, especially in a you know top six with the playing. You're scraping in five or six. I just don't feel comfortable giving it to someone who has not carried their team to a top four finish. And that is the case in this in this in this circumstance. I will go with Xavier Cooks and a little bit of Sydney Kings bias there, but it's a hard one to pick. Mitch Creek's numbers are fantastic, um, and and Bryce Cotton's numbers are, their numbers are better than Xavier's. But I think Xavier's effect on the team, outside of the stat sheet and what he brings, is the MVP. You take Xavier away from our team, um, I think we're you know we're we're in a much different position than we are. You can argue that with Bryce and Mitch Creek, but how much further do they fall? They're already kind of towards the bottom of the table. So that's my argument there. The Lindsay Gay's Coach of the Year, 
Adam Holt Ford from Cairns, Chase Buford from Sydney, Modi Moa from New Zealand. Look, I think who I think is going to get it, I think they're going to give it to Modi Moa in New Zealand. That's my pick. Uh, I think Chase Buford's a little bit hard done by at times uh, because of all the off-court stuff that was spoken about. Um, but this guy wins games. Uh, and 24-9 and nine last season, 18-9 and nine as of today with one game remaining. Um, that's a pretty pretty good record. 42-18 and 18 over two seasons if you include the – you know, that's including the finals last season. You include some finals coming this season. That's basically top 10, yeah, I think, in league history, I believe, in back-to-back winning seasons combined, right, for a winning record. So, you know, that's pretty impressive. There's names like Ken Cole, Alan Black, Cal Bruton, Andre Lamanis, and there's a few others. But that's a pretty pretty impressive stat, in my opinion. The last two years have just been, you know, immensely slated towards winning for the Sydney Kings. So I think that needs to be taken into account. I think Ford was in the running, but I think their finish to the season hasn't been great. There were some games where they shouldn't have lost, um, and I think that hurts him a little bit in that they should have locked up the second seed, in my opinion. They let that one slide a little bit, but I think Modi Moore was going to get it. New Zealand had a horrid last two years with COVID. They had to be based over here in Australia, away from their family. So I think you factor all that in, that fairy tale story. I would give it to Chase, obviously, being biased, but um, I think Modi Moore will be the winner there. Most improved player, Keanu Pinder, Cairns Taipans, um, S. McDonald from Tasmania, and, and W. McDowell White, or McDowell White from New Zealand. I think it's Sean McDonald, I believe, um, from Tasmania. So I think this one's the easy one. I think McDowell White's had a hell of a year, but Keanu Pinder just three weeks ago, before, or maybe a month or two ago before his horror run with injury, was in the MVP conversation for top three, top four in the league. So I think he gets it. He, he, he didn't have a great year in Adelaide. A um, couple of seasons ago, and for what he's done this season, the jump that he's made numbers wise, I think he's the the, the pick that I would make. Six man of the year: um, Barry Brown Jr., Kelly from Tasmania, and Johnson um, from Brisbane. Tyler Johnson. I think this one goes to Barry Brown Jr., New Zealand second in the league. They've had a great year. He was their gunner off the bench um, and bought that bought into that role as an import a star import coming off the bench. Was happy with the role, and I think he was huge and instrumental to the way. They played basketball in the way they won games. I mean, Johnson being on Brisbane, they, they weren't too good, so he doesn't get my vote. I, I love his game, but their record's awful. And I think Kelly was, was very, very good for Tasmania, but I'll go Barry, Barry Brown Jr. on that one. Damian Martin, trophy for the Defensive Player of the Year. Tony S. Cleveland, Derek Parton, and Shea Ely. I'm scratching Shea Ely out. He hasn't played enough games, in my opinion. He's been hurt, so I would generally probably have him at the top of this list, but he hasn't played enough for me. Cleveland's team's... Probably not going to make the playoffs, so I go with Pardon. New Zealand's been great. He's the the, the junkyard, dog, junkyard dog inside the paint for them. Uh, very good rebounder. Their defense has been one of the league's best, so I'll go with Pardon on that one. Next Gen Award Pro, this is the former Rookie of the Year Award, and I'm going to protest vote. I'm going with Wardenberg because he's a rookie. <laughs> That's why he wins it. Um, Froling, Illawarra, you know, they've, they've had a great year. And Travis in Perth, I don't think he's had as good a year as he had last season or the season before, and I think Wardenberg has been very good. So I'm going with him, Pro, and that is the wrap of the awards. We'll see how many I get right. Folks, you're always a, a man of mystery when it comes to these awards, so I'm going to go with you. So whatever you think. <laughs> Although I do like my, my man Mitch Creek, and I have no idea what his record is, but he was with the Mavericks for a summer, and guy was a funny bastard, I'll tell you. So I like him, and uh, so I'm going to go with him <laughs> on my pick just, just on that. So I like I like the bit I like the big jawed bastard. Well, yeah, we'll see we'll see how they go, but it'll be interesting. So I'm sure there's some betting markets for them on Dabble. So jump on there and and give it a punt. All right, stats useful or useless? This is an interesting one last week, pro. This popped up. I don't know if obviously it's changed since then, but um, the Haw- the Atlanta Hawks, pro, the ultimate even Steven team. Mm-hmm. So get this: last week they were 26 and 26 win win losses. Mm-hmm. They were 17 and 17 in the East. They were nine and nine in the West. <laughs> they were eight out of fifteen teams in the East. Even better, they scored six thousand and they've scored six thousand and fifty-seven points. And how many do you think they've allowed? The same amount. Even fucking Steven. The same amount. The same amount. The even Steven team of the century, pro. It. Useful, or useless. Uh, completely useful. Uh, completely useful. Even fucking <laughs> Steven. I'm not fucking with fate. I'm not fucking with bad karma. That is a uh, that is a mission from God, my friend. I am going to go with useful on that one. A big ass useful. 
Yeah, I like it just from a quirky stat that you just don't see often to, to even have the same amount of points scored and allowed. <laughs> on top of all that is amazing. If only playoff series went eight games, they would go four and four. They go four and four for Not sure. Enough. So uh, a little off the Atlanta Hawks. That's from ESPN. So very impressive. The ESPN actually had a, a fun stat. So usually they're pretty boring. Okay, Nikola Jokic conversation again. Uh, he's currently averaging a triple double pro. Wow. Uh, 20, 25, mm-hmm. 11.1 rebounds, and 10.1 assists. He's the first player ever to average a triple double on 50% field goal percentage shooting. He's shooting 63%. The Denver Nuggets pro, 17 and 0 when he has a triple double. He's, he's, he, these numbers are just bonkers. And I think he's one of the, one of the, um, there's another stat. He's the, the first big guy to be averaging a triple double this late in the season in NBA history as well. So, um, unbelievable stat. And what are your thoughts? Useful, useful. Oh, useful for sure. I mean, you know, 17 and 0 when that guy makes a triple double. I mean, obviously he has impact on the game. There's a lot of guys that could average a triple double over a cer- certain period of time and that team goes in the shitter. Um, to, um, I mean, obviously he has an impact on winning. I, I, I would say total useful. Total useful in my opinion as well and really solidifies the MVP chances. I know we've spoken about Embiid and recency bias, but look, if you average a triple double, to the extent where your team wins, there's a difference. There's there's guys that do get that triple double that you know when when they have triple double, their team's five hundred or they're a little you know they're they're ten and eight, seventeen and zero when he has a triple double. The effect that he has on the game with sixty three percent from the field, unbelievable. Um, one of the best seasons of all time statistically and very very useful. All right, before tonight's game against the Lakers, the Pelicans had lost ten in a row. They are three and fourteen in two thousand and twenty three. No other team has more losses in that span, pro. Useful, useless. What are you going with, Bogues? I'm going useful as far as the three and fourteen in 2023. That's pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, they they want to be that team that's in the in the mix for conference finals or building towards that. You, you got to make that that three and fourteen. You got to get at least six or seven wins in there, and even it out a little bit. You know, um, that's that's a tough one. So they they they. I think it's useful as far as they're, they're that horror month and a half. Yeah, I would say useful too. I mean, you know, that record, you know, sort of speaks for itself. I would say definitely useful for sure. What do you got for us? Bogues. Uh, well, let's first get the Kyrie thing out of the way. Uh, oh, well, first of all, a stat that you might find useful, useless. There's one player. Oh, no. Yeah, I just actually, I just throw it up on my database. I, mean, I told you I have the fire your trainer deal, and but I also have 50 40 90 currently in the NBA. There's one player. That's 50, 40, 90 in the NBA. Can you name him? 50, 40, 90. Yeah. Oof. It's, Should have paid attention more to your previous segments. And it's not going to be who you give me think, a con- but go ahead. Give me, a, give me a conference. East. You're never going to get it. East. Yeah. Never going to get it? Never going right. to get it. What do you got? No, go ahead. You can Give me a guess. I'll give you three guesses. Without looking it up right now, I'll give you three guesses. <laughs> 50, 40, 90. Joe Ingles. There's one. Go ahead. Just give me three and I'll just tell you. Uh, yes. Joe. Duncan Robinson. Nope. Mm. He hasn't played 50 minutes. Joel Embiid. Uh, no. <laughs> TJ McConnell. What? 52 three. Is he shooting threes now? Yeah, well, not really. He's shooting like 1.2 threes a game. He might even be shooting 0. .9 threes a game. Um, 52 from the field. 90 from the line, 43, 8 from three. I don't think he qualifies wow. like in leaders because I think you got to take 1.5 a game if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, 50, 40, 90, TJ McConnell. All right. So, wow. Yeah, yeah never would have got it. And then also the, never got also it. the defunct fire agent, uh, fire your trainer segment, uh, Russell Westbrook shooting 41 2 from the field, 66 from the line, and 28.1 from the three. So, um, you know, I did reach out to Giannis's people. I haven't heard back to help him with this free throw. Um, I'm, I'm for hire if what Russell wants to hire me. I'm good. So, if he needs a little help. But uh, let's go back to let's go back to fact or fake news. Uh, Kyrie Irving, let's get this out of the way. Obviously, he wants two hundred million. Does a team a team will give Kyrie Irving two hundred million in free agency uh, this July? Fact or fake news? Oh, that's a tough one. Um... <clears throat> fully guaranteed. Fully guaranteed. 
four, well, he wants four years. What is it? One eighty, right? Something like that. Um, yeah. Oh, I thought he wanted two hundred. I think so fact. Yeah. I think look. I think fact. I think someone's going to take a punt. Like if you, someone's going to take a punt. He's he's a generational talent. You can't you can't argue that. A lot of players these days, you're going to get some baggage along with the generational talent. So I think you you, you take the good with the bad, uh, and you hope that you have that discussion about you know putting everything else behind him that he's been through and all that kind of stuff and. I think he, he'll he'll get it. I think he'll get it. I think he will. Um, there'll be someone that'll do it, in my opinion. So I'll say fact. That's interesting. Um, I'm saying fake news. Um, I do think the Lakers should give it. I'm not sure if they will. I don't know if they. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Will they? Um, hmm. Yeah, I'll say fake news. I say somebody will give him three years fully guaranteed or two plus one. You know, with players these days, you know, if it's LA, then they'll probably give it, but I can't I can't go both ways on this thing. But like I, I do think that the way it goes, I think he would want his freedom to get out. But I think he would have signed it with Brooklyn if they gave him the two hundred million. Um I say fake news, so I say he gets three year deals from whoever. I don't know how they'll structure it, but they'll do they'll do three years in his favor. So I say fake news on that one. Bobes, um this year a team in the NBA All Star game will score two hundred points. <laughs> and I'm gonna add a th- I'll add a third answer to this after you after you answer. I'm gonna add a third option, but I'm not gonna give you the option. I'm gonna give it leave it for myself. Let me just I'm just Googling this previous one sixty three to one sixty last season, one seventy to one fifty the year before, and one fifty seven to one fifty five. I'll go with the percentages, I'll say fake news. They're not gonna they're not gonna get it just based on some quick research on, on, on Mr. Google. So fake news. Uh yeah, I say fake news, but I'm gonna add a third option actually. I'm not I'm not even gonna go with fake news. It's fact, fake news, or a fucking don't care. And I fucking don't care. And my Apple Watch just rang me um, as we're speaking. 18th triple double for Jokic. They win. So 18 and 0 Bogues with uh, triple double. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Bo- yeah. Bogues, how fucking bad. This is the third one, by the way. How fucking bad is this fucking dunk contest shit? Like, it's so fucking bad. They got Ma- Who's in it? I don't even know who's okay, in it. Okay, so KJ Martin, which I think KJ Martin's one of the better young Dunk, players in the league. Fair. He's pretty good. Yep. Athletic athletic as hell. Trey Murphy. Um, yeah, I guess he could dunk a little bit. Shaden Sharp, uh, rookie for Portland, decent. He gets up a little bit. And Mac McClung, Denver Blue Coats, <laughs> the white dude that went to Georgetown and transferred to Texas Tech. Yeah. Bogues. When you got to get G League guys in the – like either you just get street guys and no NBA players or don't get a G League player. No offense. Don't get a G – like this, then, then don't have any NBA players. All right. So my question to you, Bogues, is the NBA dunk contest will be gone in five within five years. Fact or fake news? Fake news, but – it won't be gone. They're, they're going to have to figure something out. They're going to have to put up more prize money. They're going to have to make it more incentivized to do it. Um, I loved it as a kid. Oh, yeah. I love seeing Sean Kemp and Michael Jordan and Clyde Drex. Like, it was awesome, man. Yeah. Um, Vince Carter. Yeah. But it's become – as soon as they started, in, you know, introducing props and cars and candles and all this kind of shit, yeah. it just lost its mystique. And then, I don't know. I, I, I loved it back in the day. I don't. I don't even bother watching it anymore because all the, all the bullshit is drawn out too long, and all the antics and cross promoting. Get it? You got to you got to sell sell sponsors and all that kind of stuff. But I think if it, to bring it back, they're going to incentivize it. Um, you know, it'd be nice for some of these these shoe companies to put in their contracts. You know, like if you if you're a high flight, if we signed you as a high flyer for Nike or Adidas or Adidas, as the Americans say, or Reebok, here's an extra meal to go to. The, if you go to the dunk contest, here's you know, 250 to go, and if you win it, you get a mil. All of a sudden, you'll see some people going in there, especially some of these mid mid tier contract guys that are high flyers that don't even want to do it anymore. Um, I'd love to see John Moran in there and LeBron in his prime and all these guys, but I guess why do it? You know, there's no incentive for it. And people say, oh, well, they're making enough money. Well, yes, they do, but you still got to incentivize them to do it, you know, and, and there's a lot of guys that don't want to do it because of 
you know, they might fail, they might look stupid and hurts their brand, this, that. So I get that. Um, but you can't force players to do it. So I think you need to further incentivize them. And the best way you incentivize them is some cashola. Folks, I say, I say fact, I say they're going to get rid of it. I, I, I think that. They, wow, gonna, really? Well, I mean, I'm probably wrong on this, but. So 40 years of 50 years of history, 40 folks, years. It's 80s? so good. Like, my first one that I saw was Larry Nance versus Dr. J, I think, in the final. And this was early. Two bowls? Uh, yeah. This was very early 80s. Then, I mean, young any young people that really haven't seen the history of the dunk contest, you got to see that. You got to see um, Jordan. Had the gold chains on. Yeah. Jordan um, versus. D, Br- D. Brown at the Reebok pumps. Yeah. So Jordan <laughs> versus. Jordan versus Neek at Dominique Wilkins in Chicago. Oh, that was a big 1987 one. 1987 or 88, I believe. I think it was 87. So the Chicago one was great. Even Jordan versus Jerome Kersey with Spud Webb, five foot eight, winning the dunk contest uh, was awesome too. I forgot who he beat in the finals, but there's been some great ones. And then Vince Carter and all these other guys, no doubt. D Brown was cool because, you know, the no look dunk. But. Uh, to be honest with you, Bogues, I haven't watched it. Remember when Iggy was winning them? Probably like early two thousands. Like, I think that might have been the last one I watched. And then like Nate Robinson and Dun- and then Dwight Howard. Like I've never seen him. I love the three point contest, but uh, yeah, I've never watched the dunk contest after that. That was a joke. But I just think it's losing its luster. Like. If you can't get guys to do it, and I'll tell you what, folks, like I think a lot of guys don't want to risk injury. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to give up mm. their all star break. You know how important. Like if you're not an all star, right, and they bring you in for a dunk contest, which I thought was pretty cool because Aaron Gordon said, "I'll go in the dunk contest if you put me in the all star game." I thought that was pretty cool. He said that like <laughs> two weeks ago. That was pretty cool. I, I got to guess. Yeah, yeah, but like, like if you're a guy that's like you beat up over the season, you fucking hate your coach. You just want to get it, you know, you want to go to like Bermuda or Mexico or whatever. And then they're going to say, hey, go to the dunk contest. And then you got to go. You got to do the media for it. And then you got to go you play in it. it. Fucks your whole all-star. You'll break up. You really want to do that for that? I mean, I don't know, man. Like, you're going to have to entice the really good players to do it. But I just can't see people liking it. But Bogues, like, what people like these days, you can't really – I, I could have put – I could have like handicapped it 10 years ago what people really like. I can't handicap what people really like in basketball these days cuz what I think they don't like they love and what I think they'll love they don't really care about either way. So I don't know. It, it, it's interesting. I mean it's different generations that watch the game. Yeah. So it's young kids want quick action Maybe they quick like it. TikTok type shit. Yeah. Maybe they like Mac. I don't know. I like to see, I'd like to see like a horse competition back too. Yeah. I reckon that'd be cool. Like just seeing you know Steph all the, like he'd win it, yeah. but like all the stuff that he does, shooting from the stairs and the I would love, stanchion. But I, you know what would really be like legendary? I think Steph versus Luca in 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 a horse competition. Oh yeah, It'd be awesome. And, and there's no no real huge risk for injury in, no. in shooting horse shots, right? Yeah. Um, unless they start bringing out fucking treadmills and all kinds of props <laughs> and dumbbells and shit. But which could happen, pro. Don't laugh. That could happen it, eventually. Luca, like, hey, hey, do a bicep curl and then shoot a three. Pretty safe to say that Luca will not bring out a treadmill for anything that he does. So yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, fair enough. But no, but I th- and to your point. To your point about injury, though, Pro, there was a, an important name, Roland Roberts, played for the Sydney Kings. He went to, uh, I believe, Virginia Tech in Southern Illinois. He was they used to have an NBA All Star game. He did the Vince Carter, you know, the mm-hmm. put your elbow through the rim dunk, dislocated it. Um, yeah, I, like, yeah, like, I think it was his shoulder or his elbow and was out the rest of the season. <laughs> Just like so, I think I think Brian Gordon might have been the coach, and like, he was not too happy at the time. I think it was I think it was Brian Gordon. Um, correct me if, I'm, if I'm wrong, listeners, but I'm pretty sure. So yeah, you can get injured trying to be stupid, especially if you're not warm, trying to really spring well, up, but. Maybe they replace. I don't think they'll. I don't think they'll uh, yeah. get rid of it though, bro. I think they'll, they'll no, try their best because right. it creates a lot of, a lot of views. But bringing the horse, man, bringing the horse comp, I'd love to see that. That'd be sensational. Talk about injury bugs, right? So uh, switching gears, American football, the Pro Bowl, like in Hawaii. So this is probably like late nineties. There was a rookie or a really young, really good player. I think he played for the New England Patriots, running back. And they had him play like uh, in just for like a gag game, whatever, like one of those deals, like um, uh, beach football. 
where like, you know, like flag football, like not for the Pro Bowl, but like like in the Pro Bowl, like within that weekend they had him play. He fucked his knee up so bad they almost amputated his leg. His career was over. So I forgot the guy's name. I'll, I'll, I'll text it to you. But it was pretty interesting. I mean, a guy. Look, how about how about that? You're a Pro Bowl. You got your whole life in front of you. A young kid. You know, I don't think he was going to be the next great player or anything. But he would have been multi-millionaire, whatever, whatever. I think he was in his like second year. Guy almost amputates his gets his leg amputated by getting hurt playing sand beach football, beach flag football. Mm. So no, I think it might have been beach volleyball. I think it was at least flag football or something. I'll look it up, but it was crazy. But yeah, I don't know, folks. I think horse. Though, going back to it, I think Horse would be fantastic. I'm telling you, you get Luca versus Steph, that thing would be 18 times anything you could do in the dunk contest. 100%. Yeah, totally. I'd be a big fan of it. I'd definitely tune in for that. I'd tune in for the three-point contest for the most part. I don't watch the rest of the shit, so I'm probably with you on that. I'd watch a dunk contest if the big dogs were in it, but I don't watch that neither. So maybe for the younger crowds, get an old pro. Yeah, I guess so. And the guy's name was Robert Edwards. Robert Edwards was the guy's name that got hurt with the football, by the way. But anyways, yeah, what are you going to do, Bogues? We're, I think maybe we're just too over the hill and we don't we don't really know what's good anymore. That's it. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll try to do an NBL wrap next week with a special guest if, if I can. I can fit that in. Otherwise, have a good week. NBL playing should be a joy to watch. NBA season heating up before All-Star break. Enjoy it. All right, see you guys later. See you guys next week. Let's get rogue.